Now, let's talk a little bit about what we need to do. Well, first, just in terms of the way we talk about energy, we need to stop demonizing uh, different sets of energy. We need to stop calling the oil guys the bad guys, and the wind guys the bad guys, and the coal guys the bad guys. We need to actually get beyond that, be a little bit more commonsensical, and actually stop penalizing those that are helping sustain our economy. We need to change our vernacular, we need to get busy about the solution. And I can say this coming straight just out of the administration, we do not have a comprehensive energy strategy. It is located in seven different departments in the executive branch. It is largely controlled by the Congress. Uh, and certainly there is a great deal of discretion left to the states in certain things, as it should be. But we don't have an overarching, comprehensive, interlocked energy strategy. When I left the administration, there were 432 pending bills in Congress to deal with energy. There were 432 really bad ideas, but everybody had an energy bill, an energy platform, an energy amendment because they wanted to be seen as being part of the debate. And so I spent my time shooting down 432 really bad ideas, hoping that at least if we did nothing, we shouldn't do anything stupid either. Uh, and that's, that's really a, a, a torturous place to be. We're seeing our, our future being debated by ping pong policies. I mean, one day we want to reduce the gas tax, the next day we want to tax the oil companies, the next day we want to sue OPEC, and the next day we're suspending shipments to the SBR. At the same time, we're not going to extend renewable uh, tax credits for renewable energy, yet we're all about renewable energy. So unfortunately, I hate to say that uh, you know, we're not being well served in Washington by our policymakers. And unfortunately, I don't think it's going to get any better in an election year. Uh, that's just the political reality. Now, maybe that provides us, collectively here, about six months of a head start to build a grassroots effort to get American policymakers to be more serious about this. And every single member and every single employee of the Chamber of Commerce here and around the world, we're going to enlist in this effort because it has got to stop. So what do we need to do? I'm going to say seven things that we need to do, they are all completely, you could probably write them down on your napkins, but because there's no pens, I'll say them for you. We obviously, we need to increase and diversify supply. We need to increase our suppliers. I found it a little interesting uh, when I took the job in the administration. I found I would be in places like here, and I would occasionally be in places like Saudi Arabia or, or others. I was in places like Equatorial Guinea. Turkmenistan, places where we are trying to make relationships with governments that were making decisions on how they were going to develop the resources. Were they going to be developed them along the lines of an Iran, a Venezuela, or a Russia? Or are they going to be more Western leaning and more market oriented? We need those supplies. It's not that America needs Turkmenistan's oil. It's that the global energy market does. We live in a global energy market. We don't have DNA you know, on, on each of these oil molecules. We need it all, and we need it from different places. And so uh, we need to cultivate new suppliers and cultivate those suppliers to adhere to market principles, open trading regimes. We need to greatly improve energy efficiency. The next best source of energy is the one we currently waste every day. Now, in the United States, we have improved our energy efficient, or the, the energy intensity of our economy a great deal. It takes 50% less now to produce $1 of GDP than it did 30 years ago. And that's terrific. That means that we are doing the right things and improving and using technology. But there are certainly things that we can do as individuals, as families, as businesses. And there's a great deal that the developing world can do as they industrialize to be an efficient energy economy from day one. And they can do that, by the way, with American technology. We own most of this energy efficiency technology, and if we could find ways to actually have China adopted or India adopted, it would create American jobs here rather than elsewhere. We certainly need to increase the use of renewable, fuel, uh, renewable energy and alternative fuels, but we have to be realistic about how much they can, over the short, medium, and long term, supply our economy. We can't just flip a switch and all of a sudden be an economy powered on wind. It's not going to happen. Wind doesn't blow everywhere. And it can't be just solar because, unfortunately, places it does. So we are, need a broad and diversified mix. And we do need renewables. They have a rightful place at the table. But they are not going to supplant molecule by molecule everything we consume uh, in oil and gas and coal and nuclear. We definitely need to improve our environmental stewardship. 
we have a growing consensus around the world that there is going to be action on climate change. Forget where you are on the science. The reality is, is the world is moving to do something, and we are either going to be led or we're going to lead. And if we lead, we need something that is actually going to be environmentally effective. No proposal has been put forward yet does anything for the environment. It certainly does even less for energy security. And the anything it does right now that is all the, the whether they are here in the United States or, or other proposals, they have huge economic dislocation consequences. So I'll talk just a team bit more about that in a bit about how we actually need to move forward on that. So those are sort of the broad principles. So how do we translate that into what do we really need to do? Well, we need to increase domestic production of oil and gas. The US is still the largest supplier of energy in the world. However, we still import 60% of our oil. We have significant oil and gas reserves around our country that have been put off limits by our Congress and by the executive branch. The Outer Continental Shelf is 80% off limits for exploration and production. We believe there's 85 billion barrels of oil in the Outer Continental Shelf. If we were able to use just the oil and gas on the Outer Continental Shelf, we could heat 60 million homes for 100 years. We could power 80 million cars for 35 years. That's just the stuff that we haven't even explored or produced yet, not the stuff that we're already producing, and, and, and that's incredible disservice to the American taxpayer right now. That we have got to find ways to capitalize on our advantage at home. We send every year $750 billion overseas to satisfy our oil demand. And it isn't all going to nice people. We are seeing that money come back to haunt us, whether it's in Baghdad, Beirut, or New York City. Not all of it. I'm not an alarmist. But $750 billion is money that we could be spending at least a portion of it here at home, creating American jobs here at home. Unconventional resources. We have three times the reserves of Saudi Arabia in oil shale in the Midwest. It's a very difficult type of resource to get out of the ground and there are companies that are spending a lot of money trying to figure out how to do it in an environmentally responsible way. But our own government has just refused the rights to lease those pieces of land for exploration. So the technology would be developed so we could use those resources. So if I say I'm not going to allow you the opportunity why, as a profit-making industry, are you going to put your money at risk to develop a technology if you don't think you're going to have the opportunity to actually exploit the resource? By putting them out for lease doesn't mean they're going to be exploited and produced because the technology isn't commercially viable yet, but it at least provides industry an incentive to develop that technology. But we've taken that option off the plate. So we've taken more oil, more gas, and oil shell off of the plate of options. That is very short-sighted in the market in which we live. <clears throat> 